Welcome, everybody, and thank you for that, Mink. Uh, before we begin, just want to uh, do an opening comment here. So special thanks uh, to Xterra Medical for hosting this, and especially Andrea Warsham, uh, who put this together and got in touch with many of you and uh, with the Xterra team. So my name is Sam Scholl. I'm going to be your host today. I have been retained by Xterra Medical to help them with these type of educational programs and to start building some educational marketing commercial infrastructure. Now that effectively, as of April, here for the U.S., Xterra Medical has received emergency use authorization for the Serif 100 hemoperfusion column for the purpose of COVID-19 patients. And so it's a very exciting time. But of course, uh, our heart goes out to you, the clinicians. It's also a very busy and trying time. So we're looking to support here as much as we possibly can. And so really, we're going to cut to the chase here because we want to be sensitive to your time. And this, in this 60-minute call, the objective really is for you to get a nice overview of what the hands-on experience and use has been around this Seraph 100 column. And we're going to go straight to it. And just so everybody's aware, this call is being recorded. And so for posterity and educational sake, and with that, I want to introduce our first speaker, which is Dr. Ming Chala, who is the chair of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board for uh, Xterra Medical, which is a you know, wonderful fit. And of course, I've learned so much from Ming, having personally worked in the critical care nephrology space from an industry standpoint, largely with acute kidney injury and having managed uh, RRT product portfolios, and most recently biomarkers uh, for acute kidney stress. And so with that, and without further ado, uh, Dr. Chawla, you want to go ahead and take it away? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Mick Chawla. I'm a nephrologist and intensivist, and I got introduced to the Xterra program because I was working with Next Stage in the DARPA program, and the DARPA program was developing dialysis-type treatments for the eventuality of a disease or virus that would arrive either through resistance or new disease that would not be treated or treatable with what we had available. This was around 10 years ago. And you know, at the time, I thought this was all science fiction, but a fun project. And I think the thing which is quite extraordinary is that they were prescient. And the Xterra device won that competition for its ability to remove pathogens from the bloodstream very effectively across a wide spectrum of viruses and bacteria. And uh, lo and behold, what DARPA had feared and been trying to prepare for has actually occurred. And basically, this is a filter which leverages heparin as a surface as opposed to a soluble anticoagulant to very effectively remove pathogens. It also has a very positive effect on the coagulation system. And it was first used in the U.S. It's currently CE marked at Walter Reed. And those two experiences with two patients were so dramatic that led to the FDA emergency authorizing the products. And so it's now been used, to our knowledge, I would say it's at least 30 to 50 patients. I don't think we have an exact count. And we've learned an enormous amount along the way on how best to deploy the Xterra filter and to get the best outcomes. And in general, we find that using it early in the patient's course of illness, and by early, I mean as they're having respiratory failure, but before they get extremely ill, pre-ECMO, certainly before they have refractory oxygenation issues, um, appears to be the sweet spot. And it can run on a regular dialysis machine. It can run on a Prismaflex or a Next Stage or any dialysis system. And we've been offering various support for the users on how to do this. So whatever system you have to do CRT or regular dialysis, the Sera filter can run on it. And we've been able to get it going at all kinds of sites, whether it be military, private, academic, and whatnot. And it's been quite a journey so far. And we've learned an enormous amount. I've had some really impressive results. And with that, let me just pause and see um, you know, if there's questions or directionally where we want to go with this. And please, if there's any questions, uh, you may need to unmute your phone. We are going to be looking at the chat function. If you just want to type something in, that's fine, too. Yeah, if you're speaking and we can't hear you, you may have to hit star six, because I think when it's a large call, the system automatically mutes everyone. Whoever is more savvy with the system than me can maybe give some better advice than that. I think that's correct. Uh, and, and Mink, I think uh, between the EU and the, the states, I think we're probably at... 80 to 100 patients treated for COVID only. Oh, okay. That's moving fast. All right. Well, let's continue. So I think that one of the things that we've 
come to understand is a sense of what the dosing ought to be. And while we don't have a precise number, our target dose is to treat 100 liters of blood. So for instance, if you know you had a patient and you were able to get a blood flow rate up of you know 500 mLs per minute, which would be you know quite high, you would try and get them over a course of two to three days you know, uh, 50 hours of treatment, right? So you basically just want to be getting them, yeah, about something in that vicinity. And so we're, we've been trying to dial this number in to an actual outcome variable. And, you know, we don't have enough patients with enough dose data to do this. But, you know, unlike KTOV, where you have a strong pre-post urea that we can do, we know that the filter is very effective at removing the virus. And so the, the log reduction is quite dramatic. The number of liters processed is probably variable from patient to patient. So I don't want people to get the idea that this is a fixed number in time. This is basically the target. We've certainly had patients that get a single treatment and do extremely well, and they don't need more treatments. And we've had other patients who you know, need up to four. The average number of filters used for a patient thus far has been around 1.5. So certainly it's on the fewer number of filters needed to get an effective treatment. And the usual decision point for the decision to continue or not is is clinical. So is there vasopressor load going down for patients who are in shock? Is there oxygenation improving? And all the other criteria. I think one of the more interesting things that we've noticed in many patients with COVID who get the filter is a really striking reduction in D-dimer. And some of that may be actual removal of D-dimer, but we think this is also having a very positive impact on the entire coagulation cascade. It's my personal hypothesis that the filter probably removes immune complex, which is part of the reason why it appears to be so salutary, not just from an infection and inflammation standpoint, but also from a coagulation standpoint. But let me pause there and see if anyone has any questions about that and where we're headed with treatment and dosing or anything technical. Yeah, this is Dr. Minnett. Uh- more than plant clear water. Can, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes. A couple of things. In terms of a treatment duration, a filter lasts how long? And you said flow, so we, or how much volume goes yeah. through, but roughly at a normal flow rate with a CRRT machine, that's 12 hours, 24 yeah. hours? Yeah, so what we would, to the degree that we you can do it, time under the curve is better. So if you're hooking up to a CRT machine, there's no reason why you can't run it for 24 hours. And you're usually running it in line with your CRT. So it makes it pretty easy. You just run it continuously with it. As far as the flow rate, if you're running it with CRT, you should run the blood flow rate that's allowing you to perform your CRT treatment most effectively. And I wouldn't worry about trying to alter that blood flow rate to get more exposure to the CRAP. If you're already doing a continuous therapy, time is going to be the key leverage on that and getting from like 200 or 250 mls per minute to 300 or 350 is not that critical i would say it's more important to keep the device up and running for the crt aspect and go some people have elected because of either preference or nursing or some combination therein to put it on an intermittent device and then that creates the need for a nurse or for some monitoring of the machine and so in that circumstance we try and get a treatment in around eight hours. Six is probably okay, but eight's better. And in that scenario, you're probably able to push the blood flow rate up because you have a dialysis nurse in the room. So I think it really depends on how you're going to set it up. And if you can do it continuously, I think you should go for the full 24 hours and then swap out at 24, and that should be a single treatment. If you're going to do it as an intermittent six to eight hours at the best blood flow rate you can manage with the access that you have. Right. And the other thing was, you, you mentioned a little bit about it, but inclusion criteria. I mean, things are changing all the time with the various medications that are put out there that have not yep. been shown to be significantly beneficial. And we're moving earlier. The earlier you get the virus taken care of, I presume you get it. So some degree of hypoxia, some degree of inflammatory change, and you're using D-dime or anything else in terms yeah, of... No, I mean- uh, Serology no, to help have, patients? No, I, so we have to still be within the FDA ISU label, and that means for patients with COVID and respiratory distress slash failure. And so they need to have some degree of hypoxia for you to use it on label, which you should. It's my sense that it's much more about trajectory. So if you have a patient who's hypoxemic and they're on, you know, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, 
And your trajectory is worsening. That, to me, is the trigger as opposed to a set oxygenation PF ratio per se or a fixed number. Most of these patients who do poorly tend to already have high D-dimers, so I don't think a threshold there is as critical. I think it does help you look at the value of the treatment. And most shops don't allow you to get an IL-6 in a timely fashion. If you did, I would probably you know, have you look at that. But my sense is that a patient who's hypoxemic who is headed towards invasive mechanical ventilation or has just gotten intubated and their trajectory is clearly poor, that to me is the sweet spot. I think there is some, I think, appropriate debate as to whether you should do it before they're intubated in a patient who doesn't already otherwise have HAI because it means you got to put in a line in a patient who it might be harder. And so what most people who have that concern have waited until they're intubated to kind of justify the risk benefit in their mind, which I think is, by the way, totally appropriate. The people who are the biggest users of the device have pushed back on us and they've gone earlier. And they've told us that, look, these patients were doing poorly. We know before they're intubated who's doing poorly. We don't mind putting the line in. And they tend to use more treatments and they tend to go earlier. And they, the feedback from those sites has been better results. So we don't have that data published yet. This is all sort of very fluid, but that's the feedback we're getting. And that's not me pushing you in that direction. I just want you to know what we've been told. And one other question about the uh, serology. We, we're looking at getting an in-house IL-6. And, you know, if it's really affecting the inflammatory cascade, the cytokine cascade, versus just being filtered out. And then the yeah, other thing so the, up- seraph, the seraph does not remove cytokines in the way the cytosorb device does. So the cytosorb device takes off both good and bad cytokines, if you believe there's a good and bad, but it mm-hmm. takes off all of them. The IL-6 in CRP decrements that we see from Seraph is not from adsorption of those cytokines. When we see a cytokine reduction, it's largely due to the amelioration of the coagulation issues and removal of the source. So when we look at Seraph treatment, I think intellectually it should be thought of as two things. One is this pathogen reduction, source control. And number two is a form of endothelial glycocalyx replacement therapy. Okay. Thank you. Hi, this is Steve Sogner at Forest General, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. What did you say? Pathogen reduction, and I did not hear your last statement, number two. Oh, yeah, sorry. So it's pathogen reduction source control, which we all know is an important thing if people you don't have. And the second is glycocalyx replacement therapy. So the internal lining of all of the endothelium has this very rich heparin surface, which allows it to, among other things, pull off pathogens, as we've learned now, but also um, it has a very positive effect on keeping the coagulation cascade in a anticoagulant mode. And when you get inflammation and injury, that glycocalyx is actually then gets completely dissolved and you get endothelial injury and you become very pro-coagulant. And so as your platelets and white cells roll against this damaged endothelium, they become much more activated. And so when it goes into the filter, what it happens is, is that environment of a heparin surface is restored to the blood. And that appears to be very salutary because the improvements we see in the coagulation cascade, which, which we didn't anticipate, to be honest with you, the seraph treatment in COVID, we've learned an enormous amount. If you had asked me before this had happened, would the filter do this? I would have said probably not. But data, data trumps assumptions, and so I would have lost that bet quite badly. Thank you. Mink, Thank you, uh, Dr. Stogner. Looks like, oh, please go ahead. Sorry, Mink, this is Robbie, uh, Robbie Mehta in San Diego. Just a broader question. The, at least the data that I'm aware of demonstrates that viremia is not a feature of COVID-19. Most of the studies which have been done with it have shown only maybe a 1% to 3% rate of viremia in multiple sample detection. So if the role is to reduce the viral load, how do you reduce it if there is no viremia as such and you don't isolate the virus from the blood? It's mostly in the pharyngeal swabs and nasal swabs or feces, and it even is very uh, minimal in Europe. Yeah, so the most recent data I've seen has put that number up quite higher. And in patients who are severely ill, the number is quite higher. Keith, I don't know, are you, do you have, I know you've been looking at this much more carefully than I have. Do you have the most updated estimates for how much viremia we're seeing in the critically ill patients? I certainly agree that if you just check people broadly, 
the number is quite low. But in very sick patients, there is a generally a pretty significant fibrinic phase, and particularly in patients who get this endotheolitis. But I don't have that number handy. I don't know if Keith, if you yeah. do. If not, Robbie, we can certainly get it to you. This is Keith McRae, and the best report is out of Germany at the University of Aachen. And in a, a case of 50 patients where they measured and looked for viremia or RNAemia, they found in the patients they tested for us, a positive rate of about 50%. But, but your, one of the things you suggested as a B filter actually removes it. So in your prior slide, Mink, you just showed that SARS-CoV-2 is removed and there was reduction yes. in number. So how much, what is that based on what that data? Yeah, so that's been based on in vitro data and it's also been based on data out of Walter Reed where they looked at PCR levels of SARS-CoV-2 pre and post. The problem currently is the coefficient of variation of the assay is not sufficiently quantitative that in an in vivo live person, we'll be able to get you know the precise reduction number because when we repeat the sample, there's variability. But in multiple cases, we've had patients who were positive before treatment and then were negative after the treatment. So, and in vitro, we know there's significant reduction and we were able to demonstrate this with other particles, whether it's bacteria and viruses in vitro. And we also demonstrated that with SARS-CoV-2. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you everybody. Uh, in the interest of time, let's go ahead and move on to the clinical case uh, hands-on experience courtesy of Forest General Medical Center. And so I'd like to introduce our next couple uh, presenters, uh, who I don't believe have any slides, but are going to tell us about their, their experience to date, and that is uh, Dr. Stephen Stogner, physician at Forest General Hospital in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, along with Dr. Brian Rifkin, as well uh, also at Forest General. And then we also have uh, Dr. Stephen Olson, uh, who will be contributing to the conversation from Walter Reed Medical Center. And then finally, Dr. Robert Gaeta, uh, who uh, is at Dwight David Eisenhower uh, Army Medical Center, and will be uh, contributing as well. So, Dr. Stogner, you want to go ahead and take us away and, and tell us what you've seen and experienced so far? Uh, sure. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Steve Stogner, Forest General Hospital, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We're a, a community hospital, uh, over 500 beds. We have uh, we have a 60-bed intensive care unit. And uh, obviously, our area has uh, had a very high number of these COVID cases and unfortunately uh, stressed ICU capacity as it has done in uh, many locations throughout the country. But we have, at the end of the day, we will have used five of these filters and have been learning as we go. But I'll tell you about three of them that we have done so far, Dr. Rifkin and I. Dr. Rifkin, are you on the call? I'm not sure if he was able to make the call. He's a real doctor. But he, he tells me I'm not. So <laughs> the first case we had was a 38-year-old gentleman who had actually had the infection for about two weeks, and we were running out of things to do. He was on the ventilator requiring high FiO2. Unfortunately, he began to develop hypotension and uh, was about to, uh, to go on vasopressors. And we uh, were able to get the filter, and we got it started. And without belaboring any of the fine data that I'll be glad to answer questions about, we ran him for right at eight hours, and we had a he did not have to go on vasopressors after initiation of the filter within hours, and in fact his systolic blood pressure went to one then uh, one twenty five. His systolic was dropping to the ninety ninety five range and was about to go on vasopressors, as I said. He did not get improvement in his uh, oxygenation parameters, and that really did, didn't surprise me because he was so far along into it. But we actually saw a hemodynamic improvement that the only variable present was the uh, initiation of the uh, CRAF filter. Uh, that gentleman is now, while he remains on the ventilator, in other words, about a, a week, Two weeks later here, he's on the ventilator with a trait, but is making wonderful progress. He's down to 50% oxygen and is about to be placed into a, a long-term care center, fully awake, participating in physical therapy, and being gradually weaned from the ventilator. 
I do attribute, as I said, we did not have, there was not other interventions that would have caused that hemodynamic parameters are so improved. So anecdotal, but at the same time, it, it certainly got our antenna up about this filter. Does anybody have any questions about that case or if Dr. Rifkin's been able to join us if he wanted to come in on this? Dr. Snogger, this is Dr. Hepburn over at UT Health. Was he on remdesivir? He had been on uh, pretty much everything, yes. He had been on Decadron. He had been on remdesivir. He had been on uh, uh, azithromycin. Um, in other words, we were throwing everything at it, and uh, he was he was progressively getting worse. And again, on the day of the filter, his hemodynamics improved without any other intervention. They were about, actually, just as a little side note, they were about to start the vasopressors when I walked in the room and told them we're fixing to do this filter, just hold off for a little bit. We didn't know. By that evening, though, he had had a dramatic improvement within hours, and I can't attribute it to anything but that. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Okay, if not, then if it's all right with the host, I'll proceed with the second case. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, this is an interesting case, a 65-year-old uh, gentleman who's actually an infectious disease physician at our hospital. Been here quite some time. Uh, a very healthy guy other than diabetes, and uh, but very, in other words, a workaholic. He was diagnosed with the COVID-19, and over the course of days had prog progressive deterioration to the point that he was on 90% uh, or more of oxygen. And uh, in other words, he was facing intubation because of his respiratory status. About, I would tell you, within about, Five, four to five days into the course of the disease, uh, we placed him on the CIRAF filter. And within six hours, within six hours, he was down to 55% oxygen from 90 plus percent oxygen. And that progressively improved after the CIRAF filter. And this gentleman was actually discharged home uh, six days after the CRF filter on room air with a saturation of 95%, he actually went home from the ICU. Now, again, that, that's one case. He was being treated for, you know, getting everything uh, prior to that, but was about to go on the ventilator. So with his was that case, Was that one treatment? Did he get one treatment? Is that just one filter yeah, that he got? One, one treatment, one treatment. So then, it, and it, it was just a dramatic turnaround. It was, you know, and you couldn't keep it quiet around here. That, you know, because he's such a popular guy, it was hard to keep HIPAA compliant uh, because everybody knew about him. But there was dramatic turnaround, as I stated, and he was actually discharged home from the intensive care unit and uh, is recuperating well at home, and I actually expect him to be back to work in a week or so. This was around August the 18th, and I suspect he'll be back to work if the reports are correct within a week or so. Uh, Hi there, this is... actually went home. Go ahead. Hi there, this is Kevin Chung um, from uh, Walter Reed and USU. Just a quick question. Um, temporarily, when had he received, say, uh, convalescent plasma and or steroids? He had been on steroids, let me look here, on August the 16th, he was given convalescent plasma, okay. He was on remdesivir at that same time. I think that was his fourth dose on August the 16th. The following day, the 17th, is when he was transferred to the intensive care unit because of his respiratory status. And then on the 18th is when we initiated the CRF field. So while you can't separate it as to what made a difference, we've certainly seen no difference in any other patient, whether remdesivir, actimera, convalescent plasma, over hours of therapy, uh, steroids included. So that got our attention, too, because remember, he was not intubated. That got our attention that, look, this needs to be done a little earlier than a last gap measure. I know what, what what all had been discussed about this, and there's nothing else to do. This try this, but 
clearly the benefit, if indeed, on this anecdotal case, clearly the benefit was we got we started him before he got to the point such that he was about to have complications of uh, of his uh, uh, in other words respiratory failure and progressive ARDS. It's just a side note on uh, uh, on some of the discussions have been here before, and we'll see by the next case I'd like to present if the host is so gracious. We're going by basically we we created our own indications and certainly we're compliant with what's stated but at the same time we want to see we want to treat people who have a reasonable chance of benefit and having been in this like the rest of the country for a number of months and i don't care if it's remdesivir at camera decadron anything if if we're already in a florid cytokine storm with the coagulopathy that goes along with this and organ failure, particularly at ours, it's not going to work as well. You know, ceftriaxone doesn't cure ARDS if you're into strep pneumonia for days before we started. And the same thing with this, this issue. But I've seen, I've not seen, and we've had a number of patients, I've not seen any kind of such turnarounds with any of these other drugs relative to the respiratory system. Like I say, we have another case that we'd like to share with you. Again, the first case I presented, we were way too far into it, 38 years old, uh, didn't know what it was going to do, and indeed it didn't help the oxygenation, or at least not during that time period, but the hemodynamics clearly improved. So any comments or questions, I'm eager to hear if you have about that second case. Hey, Dr. Stogner, it's, it's Brian Rifkin. Just want to let you know yeah. I'm on the call now. All right, Brian. I just got through the second case presented. I presented the first one where we had the hemodynamic improvement. I presented the second case that with a dr- profound turnaround in the oxygenation parameters and his and the uh, doctor being discharged home within a few days uh after turnaround from intensive care unit. We don't have many patients that go home from ICU. He did. <laughs> Hi, this is Dr. Sharma. I'm uh, calling from UT Health San Antonio, I'm Chief of Nephrology. Uh, just joining the call. Welcome. Okay. Dr. Rifkin, do you want to present the third case or would you like me to do it? It's up to you, sir. I know you like to talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dr. Ahead. Rifkin is our. Uh, Dr. Rifkin is one of our nephrologists. I'm, I'm pulmonary and critical care here, but Dr. Rifkin's one of our nephrologists and uh, has just been absolutely wonderful. Uh, he is a innovative person, and he, like I, was continued to be tired of seeing these people die with nothing else that you could do for them. But the third case uh, is a 49-year-old nurse that came in around August the 15th and had the usual uh, treatments, convalescent plasma, remdesivir, uh, et cetera, and had progressive deterioration. She got up to uh, more than 50% on her oxygen. And uh, because of our case with the physician, we were saying, you know, what about if we try this? Or, and uh, because she was obviously on a downhill course. So it, within the uh, I guess 72 hours uh, of her admission, she was placed on the cell raft filter, and I think they had some clotting problems, if I remember correctly. They ran for about three hours, if I remember correctly, and therefore she was treated again subsequent to that for about four hours and indeed had a progressive improvement over the following uh, 24 to 48 hours, actually had improvement immediately after being on the uh, CRAP filter uh, device. She has uh, recovered, discharged to home. She did go home on three liters oxygen, three liters or so of oxygen. By report at home, she still has a good bit of fatigue and all, but is indeed uh, recovering. Uh, She went home, I believe, within six to seven days after completing her, her therapy. So, these are three cases, and like I say, we will have at the end of the day, we'll have two more that we're uh, doing. But because of the uh, 
because of what we've seen, obviously the word gets out and everybody wants to know if you're going to put everybody on the filter. And because it is a, you know, a limited resource for us, uh, Dr. Rifkin and, and, and I, in consultation with others, came up with our own criteria. It's certainly more liberal than I think what a number of people have been doing. But again, if, if we don't intervene earlier, this is my personal uh, theory. If we don't intervene earlier, by the time the inflammatory process causes irreversible damage, we've missed the game. We, we, we've missed. Uh, so it, what we're, what's, what's, what, go ahead. Yes, uh, just a quick question again, Kevin Chung. Uh, thank you for presenting the, these uh, um, really fascinating cases. Did you see any signal with regards to inflammatory markers uh, when you checked them before and after? Uh, are there any consistent patterns that you've noticed? Brian, do you want to come in on that, or I'll be glad to. It's up to you. Sure. So I did uh, kind of plot out their inflammatory markers, including CRP, D-dimer, ferritin, fibrinogen, IL-6, BNP, and procalcitonin. Uh, for all patients for at least the day before and two to three days afterwards. And I would have to say that there really is no specific pattern. Uh, it doesn't seem to significantly improve with the treatment, and some people were already declining prior to the treatment. Okay. Any more? Really uh, hard to on that third we, we have a couple of other, well, like I said, we have a couple of other patients. I'm very eager to see how they're going to do. But anyway, I was telling you how we have somewhat, because of the limited resource of the filters at this point for us, that basically created some indications that we want to go by uh, specifically in our facility that, of course, that they're COVID and that they're early in the course of the disease within seven days. And we're going by oxygenation. Certainly, this doesn't limit that, they're, that they may have other problems, but we're going by that they need to be, uh, obviously, having significant hypoxemia oxygen requirements and that they have been on and are currently receiving other therapy for the COVID, such as seen in these cases. And the other thing, because, of, uh, look, with patients that have terminal illness due to another process, for instance, metastatic cancers, that they have end-stage liver disease, that they have end-stage heart disease, unstage lung disease, you know, these are patients that's going to have a poor outcome, whether they have COVID or some other infection. So we we want to give the most opportunity to the best category of patients. And so I would uh, open back up to the host and be glad to. Yeah, this is Mink. Uh, yeah. I, have, I have two quick questions. Too. Yeah, one is, uh, can, you, can you walk us through your, your dosing strategy? What kind of machine are you using? What blood flow and how long is your sort of first target treatment? And are you guys having to get a Quinton line down in interventional radiology, or are you just doing it at the bedside in the groin or the neck? What's been your preference and pattern? I think it would be useful to know the technical details of this. Dr. Riff, you know, you to you. He's a lot smarter than I am. Right, so... We all these patients have been in the ICU, so we have placed catheters at the bedside. We've had a couple of IJs, and I think we had one femoral. We're aiming for, as I spoke with Dr. Chung before, um, about 100 liters to be processed. So, because our patients have not been on vasopressors, we've been able to tolerate blood flows of 300 to 400 cc's per minute. And so, again, we've been aiming for about a five to six hour treatment to get at least 100 liters of blood flow processed. We do not currently have the platforms, although we've ordered them for CVHD. So we've been using our Fresenius 2008T machine um, and really have not had any issues with that other than clotting. And what kind of anticoagulation are you running? Are you running regional heparin or are you just running it? Are, there, are, are many of these patients systemically anticoagulated so you don't need to? Or what's been uh, your guys' uh, best approach that you've seen works best for you? Right. So most of these patients are already on therapeutic Lovenox. We've tried to adjust to higher doses, particularly that one patient who had the clotting of the filter. Yesterday's treatment, I actually had the nurse give a bolus midway through the treatment because the pressures on the filter were, were increasing. So we've kind of used a little bit of everything at this point. When we switch over to CVHD, I may even consider just putting them on a heparin drip protocol, which is our protocol that we use for CVHD. Yeah, so that, that's really helpful. Thank you. Because I think everyone has um, tried something a little different. Many people certainly have gotten it to work. But I think that those learnings about how best to effectively conduct the treatment are really helpful. So thank you for that. Hi, this is Kumar Sharma. I just wanted to weigh in a couple of uh, 
items relating to that discussion. We've had three cases in San Antonio that um, I've heard about or been involved in. Uh, the first case was a, a very advanced patient um, had been in the hospital for about two weeks before she got put on the filter with a lot of pressure, very uh, hypoxemic, and she clotted the filter and didn't survive very long after that. The two other patients, one had a pretty miraculous recovery with the a septic shock episode. Kevin knows about that case. Uh, this patient is a young 28-year-old obese gentleman who seemed to survive the initial COVID episode and then had new septic shock and was on four pressors uh, and then had a rapid re recovery after being put on the filter. And just most recently- That's the patient last... who was on ECMO at the same time? Right, right, yeah, yeah. That patient uh, ended up still on dialysis, but I think is leaving the hospital or left the hospital. That's and, uh, unbelievable. Yeah, that was just a phenomenal, miraculous case. Hunter Mike's a levofed, a uh, ton of epi and geopreza on top of vaso. Yeah, yeah. And I think it was within um, 24 hours, he was off all pressers. Uh, and just last week, we had a case here uh, of a patient uh, who was, had acute kidney injury when started on CRRT and uh, intubated, got started on the filter after heparinization, systemic heparinization, getting a PTT over 80. And uh, that patient did very well with uh, getting off pressors within 24 hours and um, and was extubated, I think, two days later. Um, and uh, I haven't heard the latest uh, update the last two or three days, but everyone was convinced that the filter uh, made the difference. Uh, I did have one question on the case that were presented in relation to steroids. Um, and the only time I've seen such a miraculous recovery in the ICU is when somebody who's truly Addisonian gets put, put on steroids and, and get, gets better. Did any of your patients um, oh. are already on steroids, or, or, or what do you think? This is Steve Sodner. I'm not, I think you were talking about, if you're talking about the other three cases, none of them were on chronic steroids or any disease, but they had also already been on uh, methylprednisolone, excuse me, on decathlon, dexamethasone uh, for the COVID-19 treatment in hot inpatients. Okay, so they were deteriorating on the steroids. Yes. Okay. So a question for the panel. Uh, and of course, uh, this includes uh, not only Dr. Stogner, Dr. Rifkin, but also uh, Dr. Olson, Dr. Gaeta, uh, really anybody else uh, that would like to chime in that's had experience with the product. Um, has anyone used the Seraph 100 on the Prisma Flex or the Prismax? And does the filter add on to the uh, AN69 M150 uh, filter or the polysulfone HF1400 filters with the Flex or the Max. Any thoughts there? This is uh, Steve Stock. I, I, I do not. I, I would punt that question to Dr. Rifkin. He may have some comments on it. Well, as I say, we have not used the uh, platform for CVHC yet. We have used the next, next stage, uh, but we have not had the opportunity to resort them. Yeah, for the for the next stage system, you have to make sure you get the open cartridge that allows you to put in your own filter. Because the other one they usually use, I think, is their 501. The uh, filter is glued in, so I think there's there's some important differentiation on which cartridge you get if you're going to do swapping in and out. Sam, you may be more fat on okay. familiar with the yeah. the P Flex and the P Max. They have some of them which are glued in the filter that is, and some of them which are open where you can open it up and put something in line. So this is a, a very geeky nephrology issue, but it, it ends up being a pretty thorny one if you set it up, all of a sudden you realize you can't open it. So um, we can certainly help support anyone who's interested in understanding that, and we can get the specs on which cartridges are which, and which ones can open and which ones can't, and uh, we'll provide that resource. Um, uh, it sounds like that could be an important uh, issue. Great. Thank you, Dr. Chala. And uh, we'll, yeah, we'll definitely uh, submit that to Exterior Medical Med Affairs, and uh, potentially put together some uh, content there uh, from the company. And uh, otherwise, uh, there's always peer-to-peer -peer resources that could probably be weighed there as well. Another question has come through on the chat line here has, uh, as I may have missed it, but because uh, we had to answer a page, but uh, does the filter affect clearance of antibiotics and other medications? Nope. Yeah, I'll take that one. It, it does not. Um, it has been tested against a large panel 
of antibiotics and antifungals and other things, part and parcel, this indication for use. And thus far, we have not found that it takes off any antiviral or antibiotic in any significant way. I do think there was an opportunity. We were working on getting remdesivir specifically done. Keith, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm updated on, on whether that's happened yet or that's still in process. But Yes, we have um, the preliminary uh, report. It's not really a report, but we've got at least the information. Uh, two patients treated in Hanover, Germany, were treated both with Seraph and remdesivir. Uh, they had pre-post blood samples and showed no effect on remdesivir concentration. So I think we've tested, what, 21 two different any effective steroids too, uh, Keith? I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, none of them bound is at all. We have another question for the panel, and that is Has anyone used CVCs to run the treatment, or have only HD catheters been used? Um, this is Bink. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to achieve the blood flow and target dosing you need with the central line. <laughs> you're going to need a dual lumen line, and you're going to have to run a, a dialysis type treatment either on a CVBH platform or on a dialysis platform. In the future, you will be able to run it off the central line, but not yet. Thank you for that. Another question just in. What considerations for anticoagulation when using the filter in tandem with CVBHF or CVBHDF? Sorry, Sam, the, you garbled there for me. Can you repeat that? Sure. The question is, what considerations for anticoagulation when using the filter in tandem with CDDHF or HDF? Yeah, so I think that Dr. Rifkin gave us a pretty good summary of the best way to go. And I think that if the patient is systemically anticoagulated, you might be able to get away with not doing anything. I think that given the level of procoagulant status and hypercoagulability we see with these patients, systemic anticoagulation is probably enough for them in the body. But when the blood leaves and hits the plastic and the filters, I think it may set off a little bit more, you know, uh, stimulus for clot. And so we have seen people need to do some regional heparin or some other regional type thing in addition. I would say if the patient is not on systemic anticoagulation, you're going to need something. And I think at the bare minimum, you should be thinking about 300 to 600 units uh, per hour of heparin in the region. I think that most patients are getting more than DVT prophylaxis with COVID, which I think is appropriate. Obviously, it's a clinical bedside decision. But I think that if you are fully anticoagulated, you might want to have a go without something regional. But if you're less than fully systemically anticoagulated be my recommendation based on the aggregate information I've heard. Certainly would like to hear what Dr. Rifkin and others and Kevin and Steve Olson think that you would need to uh, to do something regionally as well. Over. Yeah, so in the hospital, we have uh, prioritized not using heparin in our dialysis patients. So we have very attentive dialysis nurses who will flush the lines quite frequently, and that's what they were trying to do with this filter as well. So they were going by every 30 minutes to an hour just to flush it, make sure it didn't clot. Uh, as I said, the patient we were doing yesterday, I had them give a, a mid treatment heparin because they saw the pressures were going up, so they were really watching it closely. Uh, the young, one lady who had the clotting treatment ended up getting two filters. She actually was on systemic uh, Lovenox, which was at, I think, 60 milligrams, which was increased to 100 milligrams, and we were able to complete the treatment the next day without giving any uh, heparin through the machine. Uh, hey, Steve, were you on the line? Did, what did you guys do for those first two patients? I think they were fully anticoagulated, correct? Yeah, the, so one of them was systemically anticoagulated, and there wasn't a lot of problems with that. And then the other patient, uh, we did, used regional anticoagulation. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it, in the, it, it, there are heparin moieties in the, in the actual device which um, likely provides some regional protection, but the problem is that there's, uh, these patients have such Herculean hypercoagulable states that um, it's certainly of concern and, and a problem that can develop, especially if you're initiating treatment in patients who are on the sicker side, I would say. You know, in my opinion, when people get full into the cytokine storm, I think there's even another more severe state they get into um, if that cytokine storm persists long enough which is just that catastrophic hypercoagulable state. And, uh, and I think if you're in that setting, um, you really have to get aggressive with anticoagulation um, regionally uh, because of, it, they're just so hypercoagulable that they can uh, really clot off the system um, pretty easily if, uh, if you don't keep track of that. 
I also wanted to uh, jump in. It's a little bit of a non sequitur later on to the, the I think what's a very important discussion. Uh, I think that was brought up much earlier about the viremia issue. Um, it's so the, besides that German report, there's also a couple Asian reports that really kind of peg it at about 30 percent. So in mild cases, um, the viremia was 0%, and in severe cases, it was uh, 30 to 30, 30 to 40%. And this was really when the patients, they were looking at blood when the patients first presented, and they went back and looked at it. And they found that not only were the, more, the people who ultimately had more severe cases, um, did they um, have viremia, um, but some of these cases, they had viremia, it looks that like they had viremia upon reflection when they came in before they became more severe. Some of them were severe from the initial onset of hospitalization, uh, but some of them developed into more of a severe case. So I think there's no question. And then when you go back and look at the MERS data and the SARS-CoV-1 data, um, the in severe cases it was up at uh, over 40% uh, in the mid-40s. So I think there's no doubt that there's viremia. I think it's also important to remember that this is a virus, so they're shedding. So I think there, um, I think you probably have variable results as based on when you're actually testing um, for the virus. Um, and then also we're we're nowhere near uh, universal reliable virus uh, detection assay. Um, so I think that's a challenge as well. I think what is clear is that the viremia tends, to, if it's there, it tends to be the, uh, the biggest issue early. So I would echo the thoughts of the first group who presented the patients is that I'm increasingly inclined to think that the earlier treatments are better as well um, because kind of like a forest fire, would you rather have put out the fire um, regionally or would you rather be trying to use a helicopter to dump stuff on from above when things are um, wildly out of control? And, and I think the point of no return um, in these patients really becomes when they start demonstrating, you know, Herculean systemic hypercoagulable end organ processes. And the last thing I'll say for the viremia is that the, the biggest evidence actually that viremia is a significant problem is that it's very well understood and appreciated now that the virus ends up in the myocardium, in, in, the, in the myocardium, in the kidneys, um, in the endothelial cells themselves, um, looks to get into the nerves, probably the CNS, and there's really no uh, great explanation that I could come up with as to how the virus gets into all these uh, end organs and compartments uh, in the absence of having traveled through the bloodstream. Um, so I think, I think the viremia is real in the severe cases, and I think it's more a question of, of when the viremia is first present and, and it, can we get after it then. Um, it would certainly, I think, and ultimately be great if we could come up with a profile. So not every patient who's on six liters of oxygen may be headed towards intubation, um, but at some point maybe we could eventually get some, even if it's retrospective data, as to a profile that would sig signify that someone's in trouble. So if you could get, look at a ferritin, a pro-BNP, a D-dimer, um, CRP, uh, IL-6, um, if you could have a compilation of those things, um, that really uh, indicated to you where things were headed, I think that would be really helpful because I think we all know that just because you're on six liters of oxygen doesn't, doesn't dictate that you're going to end up intubated. Um, but uh, certainly if, you're, if you were to be that person headed in that direction, it, you'd, you'd benefit from uh, uh, earlier treatment. Over. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Uh, to be sensitive to time, we're approaching the hour here. Uh, maybe we can answer a couple more questions. Uh, first up in the queue, has anyone seen any increase in CLAD Z rates that could be associated with the addition of cartridge and filter to the HD or CRT system? Uh, Steve Stogner in Hattiesburg, could you repeat that question? I'm so sorry to ask. No problem. I'm cutting out a little bit. Has anyone seen any increase in CLAD Z rates? associated with the addition of the cartridge and filter to the HD or the, to the column, really, the addition of the column to the HD or CRT system. The, I'm sorry, what, uh, what Ray? I, I'm still missing the word, the, what yeah, was the first line, part? Uh, yeah, central line okay, access, clabs, uh, infection. Central line clabs. associated bloodstream infection. Oh, I can say. Uh, I have not, but I think it's, uh, this is Steve, I think, I certainly have not, and I, I think it's, it's important to note, and I, it hasn't come up for anybody who's new on these calls, that the beauty of the seraph is that it, it binds pathogens agnostically, 
um, which is a term that uh, Kevin uses that I love for the device. And so that's, it's, it's wonderful because if they, certainly they're at risk to suffering secondary or super infections in the ICU, um, but the beauty is that the, the device itself will bind up uh, that back, the, any type of bacteremia as well. Um, so I haven't noticed any, uh, any infection caused by the system, but importantly it can clear other infections. Um, that, that case, the 28-year-old miraculous case down in, uh, in Texas, um, they had uh, MRSA, I believe, as a super or secondary slash super infection, uh, MRSA bacteremia, um, and it's thought that uh, the clearance of the SARS-CoV-2 plus that pr likely a big part, the, a big chunk of it, the clearance of that uh, MRSA was a was a big component of his of his miraculous recovery. Yeah, the filter. Thank you. Of, uh, Please finding MRSA and uh, drug susceptible staph aureus. Uh, we've had several cases and a lot of in vitro work. Uh, and it's, it probably pulls out uh, 75% every time, every, every pass. Of the so it comes down very quickly. Thank you, Bob. And to conclude our call here, uh, you know, these clearly, if you're still looking at your computer screen, Xterra Medical has a lot of clinical research underway. Uh, studies and trials alike, both abroad as well as here in the U.S., so a lot of exciting activity. Uh, but it's very important that we continue these hands-on user uh, group discussions, Q&A. We weren't able to capture every question, or I should say we captured every question, but we didn't answer every question. So we will be following up with you. Uh, your point person in all these communications is Andrea Warsham. She is the Director of Market Development and your field support and so she'll be in touch with all of you and you know, what has really emerged from these discussions is there's a very strong demand for you know cohort interactions of say you know maybe I, the ideal number is 10 positions whether they're new users or prospective users existing users to exchange ideas uh, during this really tumultuous time and so Andrea will be reaching out to you to see if you want to get on that text chat group or if there's any other way that we can support. Uh, of course, at Exterra Medical, uh, we're very keen to support, especially on the health economic standpoint. Uh, when it, it's not always easy to work with hospital administrators to necessarily get this product in rapidly. And so we uh, offer our service there and we have some things that we can provide apart from the clinical piece here. But thank you very much to our experts and panel uh, who are willing to take their time and share their experiences and uh, expect a follow-up uh, as early as either today or early next week for those of you who participated from Andrea. And with that, we will adjourn the call. Thank Thanks you. Up. I enjoyed it. Right. And I want to thank all the presenters of the cases. Uh, I didn't know about all of those, and some of those are really extraordinary. So thank you for sharing them, and really pleased those folks are doing well. Yeah, this is Bob Ward. We're, we're very excited to hear the feedback. and It's very gratifying. Thank you for your, taking the time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.